if you have a Bible, um, open it to Exodus 3. We're going to look at the story Matt mentioned, uh, the, the, kind of the first encounter with holiness, Moses and the burning bush. But first, uh, think about, have you, have you had a time when you've kind of encountered something transcendent and awesome and beautiful? Anyone want to share? Maybe one or two of you want to share an experience like that? Tim? It's, uh, it's a little hard to describe, and it's not going to really probably make sense. It's kind of one of those things where, like, I can't really even make sense of it. I just remember how it made me feel. Mm. But uh, there's a couple times in my life where it was sort of like, uh, let me see everything that, you know, you imagine, you know, that there's molecules and everything, atoms and everything, you know, that that goes all the way out to all these other galaxies and stuff in this entire universe, right? Yeah, it was kind of like that. And it was basically that I could, for a moment, God let me see everything moving from the minuscule level to the to the just massive everything level at once. Wow. And yeah. <laughs> I can describe it as mind-blowing. Okay, so that's, that's good. Mind-blowing. And you said it's hard to describe, but you could tell sort of by how it made you feel. What, what was that? What did you feel? Uh, exactly what I said, mind-blowing. It was just like, it was awe and like wow. and beautiful for one. I really wish I could actually see that again on command because that was amazing, but it's only been like twice in my life. And I don't know why he did it, but <laughs> I thank him for it. Yeah. Yeah, it brings forth praise. Uh, it probably made you feel a little small to see like the breadth, the beauty of all that. Um, that's kind of what it is to encounter the holy. It's something that is amazing, beautiful. It pulls you in, but it also sort of engulfs you and humbles you. <laughs> um, it's kind of like, you know, the starry night that uh, is just majestic or the powerful waves pounding against the shore. And you know that like this vast ocean is just so much bigger and more powerful uh, and has the potential to, um, you know, cause great damage but also in its place it's it's extremely beautiful um so holiness is like that it's like a powerful and majestic beauty that can attract us and overwhelm us at the same time um it's beauty and power and danger all in one place and that's kind of the experience moses has if you look at his encounter with God in uh, Exodus 3, he's out there tending sheep, you know, he's out in the wilderness of Midian, um, and he comes to a mountain, and it says in verse 2, there the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in, fl in, the, in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? Because if you're out in the wilderness and a bush is on fire, typically it would be it would be toast and ashes, you know, within a matter of minutes. But here's this bush that's on fire that's not being consumed. That in itself, I think, tells us something about the holy presence of God that God, and he goes on to reveal his name, right, as the living one. God is alive and powerful, but his presence is able to be someplace without consuming that which it uh, burns, so to speak. Um, 
So, but it's strange. It's, it's curious. It's kind of, uh, overwhelming. Like what in the world is going on? I don't get this. And, and I think Moses, and as we go on, we know he begins to feel small. When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called him from within the bush. Moses, Moses, uh, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. Why is the ground holy? Yeah. Well, let's go to Nancy, just for variety. Uh, because God is there, and since he's holy, he makes everything holy. Exactly. Yep. Um, this is a, a key piece of understanding holiness, is that things are holy by association. God is holy within himself. Everything else is holy because he touches it or sanctifies it. So uh, the temple and the tabernacle are holy split space for the same reason that the burning, the ground at the foot of the burning bushes is, is holy space because God's presence is there. Um, the, the, um, the, the instruments in the temple are sacred and holy because they're used in the service of God in the holy space. Um, the priests are holy because they represent God and they take care of the holy space. Here's one that we don't often think of, but the Sabbath is holy. Mm -hmm. Remember the command? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Why? Because it's time set apart by God. Just like uh, the, uh, uh, the temple is sacred space, the Sabbath is sacred time. Israel herself is holy because she's chosen out of the nations to be in a unique relationship with the Holy One. And she's called, like the priests are, to represent his uniqueness, his holiness, his name to the nations. So God is intrinsically holy, and every non-God noun, person, place, or thing, is holy by association. Um, and in the presence of the holy, like we talked about before the break, certain things are not appropriate. Sometimes some of those things are moral sin, right? Is not appropriate. Um, but some of them are just, uh, things that sort of contradict the, the nature and character of God, uh, things associated with de death and disease, um, you know, skin diseases, corpses, all that kind of stuff. If you touch that stuff, you're defiled and you can't be in the presence of God, not because you did something wrong, but just because you're carrying around like uh, a, a the contagion of, of death and it's not appropriate to walk into the presence of the living God with that on you. So purification is required. So again, in the Old Testament mind, holiness and purity are categories that involve that in, encompass um, morality, but that's not the sum total. Um, but there is this reality that Moses feels, just like we feel when we have a transcendent experience, where we feel small and we feel inadequate, and maybe even we feel sinful. Um, Moses, God says to, to Moses in verse six, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Okay. He, he, he realized I'm in the presence of the God of my ancestors. And I know the stories about this God as the creator and the one who's in covenant with my people. And uh, I know he's great and glorious and majestic. And so I just need to bow down. 
right? I need, or I need to turn away. Um, and later, Moses will have encounters where he goes into the presence of God and he comes away with his face glowing because he's been uh, in proximity to God's holiness and glory. But at this point, he knows he's not worthy. Is that the right response? To encountering the holy? Yeah, Nancy. What do you mean? Like if he, if the response that he had where he turned away or? Yeah. Because, well, I, I, I believe so. I think like, um, I can share my experience I had. I had one where it was impossible for me to open my eyes. Mm. And even though I wanted to see, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and he doesn't allow it. And um, what I experienced was I was being embraced and like lifted off of my bed, like as in a hug and my whole face, like if felt like if um, when you rub your face against somebody else's and your cheek goes up and my eyes were closed. I had just got done praying and I heard rivers of water, felt mm. the rushing of wind, felt all that, you know, and I was just like, whoa, what's going on? And all I felt was just somebody hugging me. And, and I knew it was God. I felt like the, I, I don't know if you can feel light, but I think I felt light. <laughs> So it was just, but it's not that we, he didn't want to see, I think. I think he wanted to see because he even asked God, like he wanted to see his face, but he told him he, anybody who does see him would die. So he was able to see his back. And for, for me, it was like, I couldn't open him for the life of me. I was like stuck with my eyes shut until that moment dissipated so wow yeah that's really interesting powerful story thank you for sharing uh because it's it, it gets at everything we've been saying this overwhelming uh sense of presence it's love it's light but at the same time it's too much for us to bear in our current state right um and I think this is where sometimes we come into problems because we see stories in the Bible or hear people tell stories where like holiness is too much for us. We can't really encounter it. We can't look on it. Um, and we think the problem is with God. But I think it, like God is kind of judgmental and self-righteous and you know, holier than thou, and so he's kind of mean about who comes near him. Um, but it's not so much that God is mean as that we're mortal and sinful um, or ritually impure, you know, all of the above. Um, we live in a world where we, we get poop on our shoes and sin in our hearts and it's impossible to avoid uh, so I don't think that the Bible, the Bible necessarily paints a picture of God's kind of up in his holy space kind of bolting the door and keep everybody out of here I can't have anybody defiling my space um, it's that God's light and goodness and truth are so overwhelming that uh, we can't, we can't open our eyes. We can't enter. We have to hide our face. It's just our natural reaction. Um, but what happens when we do humble ourselves and hide our face or, you know, respond with, uh, the fear of the Lord. Um, 
God doesn't smite us. He cleanses us. And this is where we go back to Isaiah, uh, which Daniel mentioned. You can look in Isaiah 6. There's a famous story. This is the call of the prophet. And he has this vision <clears throat> where it says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they covered, or with two, they were flying. So God, in his beauty, in his temple, he's got these uh, strange creatures flying around him. And they're, they and themselves are these kind of majestic Kind of terrifying things and they are calling out to one another holy 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 is yahweh almighty the whole earth is full of his glory and it, and if that weren't kind of overwhelming enough at the sound of their voices the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke so earthquake or just the in this vision he's experiencing the the power of God that just shakes everything around it. Um, and how does Isaiah respond? Kind of like Moses did, and probably exactly right. Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined. For why? For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So instead of assuming the problem is with God and he's some kind of meanie, Isaiah recognizes what we tend to recognize when we get in the presence of the transcendent. Whoa, I'm small and I'm mortal and I'm broken and I'm unclean and uh, I shouldn't be here, right? Which is interesting enough that God puts him there. Like he really shouldn't be there. But then what does God do when Isaiah responds with humility? Then one of the seraphs, one of these strange flying creatures. Yeah, Matt. Um, a little louder. God sent a seraphim with a burning coal to purify Isaiah's lips. Yes. And when he does that, he says to Isaiah, look, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Um, I think it's interesting that the burning coal comes from the altar, the place of God's presence, and it goes out to touch Isaiah's lips. And it's like, it is a little piece of the fire, right? It, it, it's like God's holiness is moving out from himself. And the interesting thing is, that when it does that, it has the effect of cleansing Isaiah. In the, in the biblical world, uh, like if you read Leviticus, we've already talk, touched on this, impurity was contagious. If you touch an impure person or a dead thing or the wrong kinds of fluids or the wrong kinds of animals, if they come into you, they render you impure. But God is not defiled or infected by our impurity. Instead, it's his holiness that's contagious. And his holiness goes out from himself <clears throat> into the impurity in order to purify. This is the story of Jesus. Matthew mentioned as well, he came and he 
interacted with unholy people. He cleansed lepers. He forgave sinners. Um, he raised the dead. He wasn't defiled by the corpse. He gave it life. And then he made atonement. Your sin is atoned for. That coal atoned for Isaiah's sin. The, the son coming from the father atones for our sin. Um, how did he do that? So instead of being stained by our impurity, he chose to bear it. On the Day of Atonement, one of the things that happened was they would, the priest would put his hands on a goat and symbolically transfer all the sin and rebellion and wickedness of the people onto the goat, and then they'd send the goat out into the wilderness. And it would carry away the sins of the people out of the camp so that the holy God could continue to dwell among them. And the Bible uses this language of bearing sin. First uh, Peter 2.24 says that he himself, talking of Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. And that last part, well, the, the first and the last part are both uh, echoes back to Isaiah 53, a famous passage about the suffering servant where it says this, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will make them righteous. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, I think it's profound and powerful to think about a holy God who isn't self-righteously holy or exclusively holy or separate beyond fellowship, but constantly and continually creates a way for fellowship with his people by being the one who bears their sins himself. So if there's any notion of uh, kind of a holier than thou attitude in God, uh, Jesus should put it to rest. Because it's from his from the very presence of God, he comes out and uh, trades our impurity for his contagious holiness. Okay, we're down to just a little bit of time, but any thoughts or questions following up from that? Founder. Okay. Um, yeah, Liz. Um, I know that in our um, meeting for the discussion that we have to do today, he mentioned it a bit, but I was hoping you could expand a little more where he says that sometimes we tend to separate a loving God from a holy God as if being holy is not being loving. Um, yeah. Could you expand on that a little bit, please? Yes, I think. If I, uh, I think it's summed up pretty well on um, page 114. He says, people say things like, yes, God is loving, but he's also holy. As if holiness is an unloving thing. The cold side of God that stops him from being too loving, right? And I guess in terms of expansion, uh, I would attempt to summarize what I was just um trying to unpack that like um, 
again, holiness is about distinction, which includes a moral distinction, but really it's just this fundamental distinction of creator and creation. God is, is distinct from and far above all human beings and all other gods, um, everything that is made. And so it's not that if his holiness is fundamentally his distinction, it's not fundamentally his like s sort of air of moral superiority um, that is somehow in conflict with him uh, reaching out in love. The, 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 in fact, the holiness of God is like the thing that distinguishes him from all other gods is that he loves his creation enough to send himself out and purify it um, and rescue it from the defilement that has, has it um, groaning and reeling and careening towards self-destruction. Um, so that was one, one piece, uh, it was in here somewhere, but I didn't touch on it, but like the, the, oh, when, when he comes to Moses, he says, um, you know, this is holy ground and Moses hides his face. I'm the God of your fathers. Then the very next thing he goes on to say is that far from being some kind of cold, unloving God of the, the ancestors, he is the, the faithful covenant keeping God that we've been talking about for the last few weeks that is coming to rescue his people. He's coming to show compassion and grace. He sees their suffering and hears their cries and he's, he's coming into action to, to set them free from this harsh slavery and oppression that they're experiencing. So like God's uniqueness among the gods is precisely in the fact that he, he is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love or loyal love and faithfulness. Um, and, and he works that out. And so the, the first time we, we, the first time the people of God encounter him in his holiness, uh, they see him acting in love. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, the, the next part was glory. There's lots that, you know, we could say. Um, here's the, the basics of it, since we just have a couple minutes. This is another one where I think we need to reframe and reemphasize. Um, even Reeves talked, he talked a lot about glory as light and, and and I think that's true. That's a, a the, the Bible often brings those two images together. Um, but glory at its at its deepest root concept, I think, gets at the true essence of something. Like um, Andy Crouch has defined it as the fullness of true being, and I think there's something to that like the, there's this weightiness uh, which he talked about in the book but it's it's uh, a way of tapping into what is at the deepest core of a thing or a person the most essential character of God is put on display when we talk when we see his glory right um, and so to give glory to God is to affirm that most essential truth about his being, his innermost being. Um, and that's why light is so appropriate because God is beautiful and he's outgoing and he radiates out from himself, just like the beams of the sun to bring light and warmth and life to everything that they touch. And God is the same way. But there's this other whole side of glory in the Bible that we don't often talk about. Um, not so there's this the light and the splendor but in the bible glory 
I think more often than not, although I haven't, you know, worked it out and done all the statistics, I think more often than not, it's associated with royalty and with the status and power of kingship. And I think this is missing in our discussions of glory. I'm going to give you just a couple uh, examples from the Psalms, and then we'll call it good, and maybe we can uh, spend a little bit of time. Actually, we will pick up on this discussion as we talk, as we move into anthropology uh, in the next week or so, because we'll see that God doesn't hoard his glory, but he shares it with humanity, and that's part of what it means to be made in his image. But Psalm 24, for example, um, it's a song about uh, preparing for Yahweh to come into his temple. Lift up your gates, your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is he, this king of glory? The the Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. So this, this victorious king is the one who's talked about as glorious. Another Psalm um, 145 praises God as king. It says, I will exalt you, my God, uh, my God, the king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And again, this all started with God as king. And then there's all this glory and majesty language. The Lord is good to all. Here's the holiness. Like most kings aren't good to everybody. They don't have compassion on all that they have made. Um, but Yahweh does. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people might know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom, which is an everlasting kingdom, a dominion that endures through all generations. So, um, kingdom and glory. I want to make the case that those two things are linked together. Um, and we'll just land here. Jesus came as God's king, right, to establish his kingdom. And he teaches his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And then at the end of that prayer, some scribe really early on in the tradition added this thing that most of you have memorized uh, because it's been there so long. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. All those three words, they, they, they like dance with each other uh, all through the Bible. And that, that little added uh, kind of burst of praise at the end of the Lord's Prayer comes from 2 Chronicles 29, where... Uh, the poet prays, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. So I want to make the case that glory isn't just about God's light and splendor, but it's about who he is as the king of all. And it's about that royal status and power. And like I said, we'll have more time to unpack that and and the truth, the glorious truth, that God shares that glory with the people that he's made so that we can uh, be agents of his kingship in his creation.